Was the use of exploding pages and walkie-talkies a war crime under international law? And for the purposes of this post, I shall be focusing on whether a specific treaty, Additional Protocol 2, on booby traps has been violated. And I will be assuming, as the initial reports indicate, that the State of Israel or its security service and agents were behind this well-planned and concerted attack targeting members of Hezbollah in September 2024. This is yet to be confirmed. For context, the conflict between the State of Israel and Hezbollah, a political and armed group, has its roots in territorial and political disputes that go back decades. A region which has been volatile for over a hundred years now. And it is clear that tensions have massively escalated to concerns of an all-out war between Israel and its allies and Hezbollah and its allies following the exploding pages and then walkie-talkies killing and injuring Hezbollah members and civilians in Lebanon. For those who are new to international humanitarian law, IHL, in general, this is a set of international rules contained in the Geneva Conventions and their additional protocols, which governs the actions of states and also armed groups during an armed conflict. International humanitarian law is often referred to as the laws of war. In other words, what states and groups can and cannot do during an armed conflict. International law sets out in treaties agreed by states the five general interdependent principles which parties to a conflict must adhere to. If they don't, then their actions amount to a war crime. Firstly, military necessity, which permits armed forces to engage in conduct even when such action will result in destruction and harm. The concept of military necessity acknowledges that under the laws of war, winning the war or battle is a legitimate consideration. In this case, was the use of exploding pages and walkie-talkies justified as necessary to achieve a military objective? Secondly, distinction. The principle of distinction holds that only fighters may be directly targeted. The principle is meant to protect civilians in armed conflict. While soldiers could be targeted lawfully under normal circumstances, it is prohibited to target them if they surrender or are wounded or no longer pose a threat. In this case, was the attack using exploding pages and walkie-talkies clearly directed at active military combatants, soldiers, fighters and personnel of Hezbollah, and not civilians or even soldiers who were not a threat? Thirdly, proportionality. The principle of proportionality limits potential harm to civilians and demands that at least amount of harm is caused to civilians and when harm cannot be avoided, it needs to be proportionate to the military advantage. In this case, did the harm to civilians numbered in the thousands outweigh the military advantage by killing and maiming members of Hezbollah? Fourthly, precaution. In the conduct of military operations, constant care must be taken to spare the civilian population, civilians and civilian objects. All feasible precautions must be taken to avoid and in any event to minimise incidental loss of civilian life, injury to civilians and damage to civilian objects. In this case, was it feasible to issue a warning prior to an attack considering it took place in civilian areas? And fifthly, humanity. While international humanitarian law permits violence, it prohibits the infliction of unnecessary suffering and superfluous injury. In this case, were civilians, including children, subject to unnecessary suffering? Now, taking these five principles as a whole, Israel may seek to defend its actions and any accusations of war crimes under the claim of military necessity and targeting high-value Hezbollah operatives. They may argue that since Hezbollah embeds itself within civilian areas and uses civilian infrastructure, such as these specific communication devices, these actions were unavoidable. However, critics will argue Israel has committed a war crime, would point to breaches of at least two of the five principles, distinction and proportionality, given the large-scale reported civilian casualties and harm to children. Perhaps the most compelling argument provided by critics that a war crime has been committed by Israel 
is that Israel has breached additional protocol two by using booby traps generally prohibited by international law. It is noteworthy that the additional protocol two arose from grave concerns during the Soviet Afghan war, where it's alleged that Soviets manufactured and planted booby traps disguised as children's toys or everyday items. The full title of Additional Protocol 2 is Protocol on Prohibition or Restriction on the Use of Mines, Booby Traps and Other Devices as amended on the 3rd of May 1996, Protocol 2 to the 1980 Convention as amended on the 3rd of May 1996. The Additional Protocol 2 prohibits the use of booby traps, an issue that is at the heart of the current controversy, where the recent attacks in Lebanon using pages often kept on a belt at hip or in a pocket, the head height of a young child, and then walkie-talkie radios, both devices used primarily for communication, were reportedly rigged to explode, triggered from a likely message causing the death and injury of Hezbollah members and also civilians. The key questions that arise whether war crimes have been committed in this way are these. One, whether the rigging of devices like pages and walkie-talkies falls within the definition of a booby trap as per additional protocol two and thus prohibited. Two, whether the placement of explosive pages and walkie-talkies in residential areas outside a battlefield amounts to being indiscriminate. And three, whether the use of explosive booby traps could be justified because the targets of such attacks presented an imminent threat to Israel. To answer the first question, booby traps are defined in Article 2.4. Booby traps means any device or material which is designed, constructed or adapted to kill or injure and which functions unexpectedly when a person disturbs or approaches an apparently harmless object or performs an apparently safe act. Article 7.2 clarifies the different forms of booby traps and includes it is prohibited to use booby traps or other devices in the form of apparently harmless portable objects which are specifically designed and constructed to contain explosive materials. And Article 3 specifically explains the general prohibition of booby traps and why disguised items as harmless objects are prohibited. It is prohibited in all circumstances to use any mine, booby trap or other device which is designed or of a nature to cause superfluous injury or unnecessary suffering. And Article 7.3 explains the prohibition of booby traps when there is a concentration of civilians. It is prohibited to use weapons to which this article applies in any city, town, village or other area containing a similar concentration of civilians in which combat between ground forces is not taking place or does not appear to be imminent. In this case, it is apparent the pages and walkie-talkies could easily fall into the definition and construed as a booby trap and thus subject to a general prohibition and specifically prohibited in a concentration of civilian areas where there is a no combat between ground forces between Israel and Hezbollah subject to the limited exception mentioned later. Now turning to the second question, whether the placement of booby traps amounts to being indiscriminate, this is explained in Article 3, when the placement of booby traps could amount to being indiscriminate. Indiscriminate use in any other placement of such weapons, A, which is not on or directed against a military objective, or B, which employs a method or means of delivery which cannot be directed at a specific military objective, or C, which may be expected to cause incidental loss of civilian life, injury to civilians, damage to civilian objects, or a combination thereof, which would be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated. In the case of the explosive laden pages and walkie-talkies, would likely breach Article 3.3b and c, the indiscriminate use related to those killed and injured were not all military personnel. Many may have been soldiers, but others could have been part of the political, administrative, political wing of Hezbollah. And the placement point 
to an indiscriminate use based on reports stating over two days at least 32 people were killed including children and over 3,000 were injured some critically in homes and in shops finally turning to the final and third question whether the use of explosive booby traps in pages and walkie-talkies could be justified as the targets of such attacks presented an imminent threat to israel and article 33 provides a prohibition to use weapons unless there is an imminent threat and they are placed on or in the close vicinity of a military objective in this case, clearly reports state that Hezbollah used the pages and walkie-talkies as a means of, of communication. The question is whether all or some of those Hezbollah members were in the battlefield, in the battle mode, an imminent threat. Again, this is a question of fact, but from multiple accounts, many of the exploding pages and walkie-talkies took place outside of the battlefield during shopping trips or at home among family members. So to the concluding point, all war is terrifying. Here, the terrifying nature of booby-trapped pages and walkie-talkies, which can explode without warning, adds to the anxiety of the tactic and also to its effectiveness. However absurd or irrational this thought is, the use of booby-traps also makes us question, are the phones, TV or any personal household items we own and possess safe to use? Not for the first time, the conflict presents a set of legal issues heated arguments on both sides and raising significant concerns under international humanitarian law. Supporters of Israel's actions will likely reiterate the point that Israel has a right to defend itself, has no alternative but to carry out such methods to defeat the enemy, deflect any criticism by reference to how audacious the attack was, while ignoring the civilian lives lost and injured. The fiercest critics of Israel's actions will likely reiterate Lebanon and other groups' right to defend themselves and the need to reassert their strength to their enemy, a seemingly never-ending cycle of violence. As for some in the United Nations and various international human rights organisations, they have condemned the use of such booby-trapped devices, labelling them a terrifying violation of international law, killing dozens and causing widespread injury and sparking calls for accountability and de-escalation. Ultimately, it will be up to someone or some international legal body to assess whether these actions rise to the level of war crimes and whether those responsible will face consequences. I hope you found this post useful. Introductions to the five principles of the laws of war, international humanitarian law, and the additional protocol two on booby traps. Feel free to comment. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to stay updated on key developments in international law and human rights. And thank you for watching.